really excited to be here. Um, it's uh, been about six months that we planned this uh, event. Uh, we're excited, new format. Um, when we thought about what's happening in transportation and thought specifically about the future of freight, we thought this format was a way to present the best of the best in terms of innovations and technology and where the market is headed. So we're very excited that you guys are going to spend the next couple of days really visiting with some of the most powerful uh, applications in the industry. So very excited about this. Today, I'm the only one that's going to use PowerPoint presentations because I think I want to lay out the framework of how we envision what's happening in the industry and kind of the inspiration behind transparency. Uh, <laughs> we need a password? So, <laughs> uh, we, we planned a lot of stuff, but can't plan the technical elements. This computer as a password. So, anyways, um, very excited, so I'll do it without slides, which is, is great. So, um, you know, I came from this industry. I grew up, my father uh, started what's now the largest privately held trucking company in the United States, and, and I saw how he used technology to really uh, gain an edge in the market. Um, trucking, as, as anybody in the room, and most of the room knows, it's a very competitive business. It's a, it's a business that, uh, is high asset, uh, requires a lot of capital, and is very, very competitive. And the way that my father built his business was really using technology and data to, to gain an edge on the marketplace. Um, and you think about what's happening with all of the technology innovations taking place in this industry, I think that's the same concepts that people are building uh, to really construct and change how our business operates. Uh, venture capital continues to pour inside the freight industry measured in billions of billions of dollars of venture capitalists that believe that they can disrupt the way the freight business operates, disrupt the incumbents and perhaps create whole new enterprises. And I think all of those things are pretty transformative when you think about the fact that I've been around this industry my whole life and when I tried to raise money in 2006, most VCs, if not all, kind of said trucking is just not that interesting or freight's not that interesting. But what's happened over the last decade is it's become pretty transformative in terms of how people think about where the market's headed. So um, I'm, I'm excited to, 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 to talk about what we're doing and, and hopefully lay out the landscape of where we think the market's headed. So we chose the name transparency because of, if you look at all of the uh, uh, venture capital startups that are in the space as well as companies that are the incumbents that are talking about new applications, one of the foundational things that they are focused on is the idea of transparency. And what is transparency? Uh, if you look at the definition, you take uh, Webster's dictionary of what the word actually means. It means basically free from pretense or deceit. It's easily detected or seen through. It's readily understood, and it's characterized by visibility or accessibility, and most importantly, the business practices. And I think the startups that you'll see today, as well as the incumbents and, and technology companies that are innovating, ha are building transparency into all the products. I think all of them have a component of transparency. And I think the reason for that is that tr the freight transportation business historically has been very opaque. How do I know where the products are? And how do I know who has, has possession of them? And how do I know where they're going and who touched them? And um, all the paperwork and all that. And so all of this, these companies are wanting to innovate and change the way that the business operates. And a little bit about uh, this event specifically um, is there are, over the, the, the three days that represents the BIDA symposium, which was yesterday, and transparency, is there's a total of 885 attendees representing 569 companies. Now, I think one of the most interesting stats of this is that there are 189 technology companies in the room. They're the largest constituent of folks that have decided to come to Transparency. It's a tech conference, not surprising, but what is surprising is how diverse those companies are. We have startups, we have, uh, we have large, very large Fortune 50 companies in the room, technology companies, as well as a lot of the existing uh, 
uh, participants in the market that are also presenting technology. And so we think about what that means and where it's headed. It's a very diverse group, and I think it represents uh, how our industry is headed and where it's actually going. The other thing about the audience here is they represent 16 countries. So we have folks from China, Japan, South Africa, Singapore. And they've come here because the United States freight market is the most diverse, the most sophisticated, and the most competitive market in the entire world. And if innovation is going to happen, it's going to happen inside of North America. And I think Atlanta is the right place to also host it because I think if you've paid attention to the news lately, you'll see how transformative the state of Georgia and the city of Atlanta are focused on technology innovation and freight infrastructure. Whether we're talking the Savannah Port, we're talking the dedicated truck highway, or the rail, rail expansion in Atlanta. So it's a, an important place for us as we think about where to host this particular event. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the history of how we came up with freight waves and transparency and how we got here. And so a couple of years ago, I, I had a payments company. And uh, in fact, this, this uh, format for this particular event is modeled uh, after what I saw in the payments business, which is the idea that companies are coming up not using slide decks, but actually coming up and showing their technology five minutes to show some really interactive and sexy UI. And, um, and that's how we, we thought of this. But I sold the business to US Bank and spent a couple of years uh, doing some consulting with some of the uh, venture startups that in, in freight. And as a day uh, to keep myself occupied, I was day trading stocks, trucking stocks, because I thought I knew something about trucking. And what was interesting about it is I was Listening to uh, some of the top executives, including my father, about the state of the industry, it was 15, uh, early 15, and he was talking about how great the freight market was, strongest market ever, and yet the stocks were starting to, uh, I wouldn't say collapse, maybe that's the right uh, impression. But there was something very interesting going on where the largest carriers, their stocks were being downgraded, stock prices were collapsing, and yet as you talk to the largest executives, and not just U.S. Express, but you go to any of the earnings reports in the second, uh, into the third quarter, the executives were talking about how strong the market is. But something fundamentally is different. The small and independent carriers were seeing the market collapse. And I thought about that and said, if the largest carriers are somewhat insulated from these broader pressures, and they don't have enough information about the market, how, does that, how do you solve for that? And so we, we came up with the idea to create a futures market. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but to create a futures market, you've got to have a substantial market. And the thing about freight is it's $726 billion. It's 30% bigger than oil, natural gas, and coal combined. It's a massive industry, and so it certainly is big enough. But how do you go do that? Well, you need proper news and data to do that. And so we created Freightways as a way to kind of push out information to the market to educate people about all the things that will impact supply and demand in the freight markets, and that's how Freightways came about. So I've been around trucking, as I, I mentioned, and I, when I was a kid and, and even in college, um, when I mentioned trucking, this is what people thought about. It's the way it was reflected in the 1970 movies that show these outlaws, like in the movie Convoy, or Over the Top, or Smoking the Bandit. This is how most people, at least until a couple of years ago, and perhaps even now, think about the industry that we're all in. It's an old, sleepy industry where the people are not, I talked to a lot of venture capitalists and say, are truckers, can they get this? The people in the freight industry understand technology because their view is this. These are the people that they view are representative of our industry. And I think all of us recognize that's not actually the case. In fact, if you go to most freight brokerages or, or trucking companies of any scale, you'll see what looks like a trading floor that you would see in Chicago or New York, trading equities or commodities. It looks like a trading floor. In fact, a lot of the freight brokerages hire from that. And freight is sexy. You know, Elon Musk, who is no short of big and bold vision, has said he's gonna roll out a semi that's fully electric. He chose this market because it's big and it's massive. And I think the opportunity to disruptive is substantial. So over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to tell the story of freight from our headlines. So we cover a lot of news in freight waves. And I think it's important to talk about over the next couple of months, or last couple of months, 
what's kind of taking place in the market. So we'll start with the electric truck that Elon Musk, regardless of whether you buy these headlines and, and consider them valid, I think there is a substantial statement that the idea that you can create an electric vehicle that can go 500 miles is pretty profound. Now, we won't argue about the physics for a second, but we will talk about the innovation. Tesla's stock was on a tear because of it, certainly not recently. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't mention Nikola's truck, the fuel cell truck. Fuel cells came out in the NASA space shuttle uh, as a way to power the space shuttle, uh, and it's the idea that hydrogen, so we may move to a hydrogen economy. And I think, and, and Heiser Bush put their mark on it. They ordered 125 Tesla vehicles. They ordered 800 of this de novo startup OEM. 800 for a fuel cell vehicle. And of course, Thor, a, com a company that came out of nowhere, has also said they're going to roll out an electric vehicle. In fact, tomorrow you will hear from Thor, one of the co-founders of Thor, well, he'll make his case that he can create a cold start OEM and compete with the biggest and baddest brands in that space, and that he will take, they will take and create an electric vehicle. So we'll hear his approach, and we have a fireside chat we're looking forward to. But none of this is without issues. And so we think about the fact that as the US and really the global economy, we're still dependent upon power sources. We can talk about the emissions for electric vehicles, but until we address alternative solutions, it actually doesn't solve for anything. And we've, of course, covered that, that actually electric vehicles dependent upon the power grid actually create in their total production and total use about twice as much of emissions simply because they draw on the coal-based power grid. And then cobalt, a, a, a commodity that's used in all batteries and electric vehicles, there's a shortage and perhaps most troubling, it comes from places where uh, people are using exploited labor because it's such a rare commodity. People are, 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 are using it in places that are taking advantage of child labor and, and humanitarian. So these things are massively important that we think about technology and get excited about it, but there are other things that should be considered. And of course, you don't have to go anywhere, whether it's on our news outlet or any news outlet, and everybody talks about this idea of a driver shortage. And there's two schools of thought. Is it really a shortage? Or is it the fact that the industry salaries and compensation levels have not kept up with the, uh, the, the broader jobs that folks have alternative roles? And so John Kingston would argue that any commodity should not, that's short should not be called a shortage, but really a squeeze. And I think it's true in really all types of jobs in this industry, whether we're talking technicians or freight brokers, whatever, there is a significant labor shortage. And so hopefully as we look at the technologies that transverse this industry, we'll hear about uh, some of these things. And of course, ELDs, a very polarizing subject, probably not to this audience, but across the industry. If we write an ELD subject and it has anything good in it, uh, we get nasty feedback about how ELDs are destroying people's lives. But ultimately, what ELDs do is they give carriers pricing power. They create a framework where we have these rules, the hours of service, that the biggest carriers have to adhere to because they get audited and because lawyers will use their lack of compliance against them. And it levels the playing field for the small guy, or the big guys and small guys. They have to uh, correspond to these. But of course, ELDs themselves don't make the industry safer. In fact, in many studies, implementation of ELDs actually create issues for drivers because they take their ability to determine their own health and body and whether they're fatigued or not. And so one of the concepts is this idea of the 14-hour rule. And Keep Trucking's come out with a petition as well as others. It says that we need to give the autonomy of the driver the ability to, to decide his own body and whether he is comfortable, he or she are comfortable driving the truck based on how they feel. And so these are, these are big issues. There's been a lot of discussion about the digital brokers, the Uberization. And so we were curious what kind of impact, because you get a lot of noise. We write a lot about it. And you talk to the largest freight brokers and companies, and they say, well, these are, these are digital brokers with a really 
cool piece of technology. So we wanted to find out how much freight is being sourced from the digital brokers. And so we did a survey. And we found out that the vast majority of freight is being sourced directly from shippers, while digital apps are really not a factor. In fact, when you look at the data in our survey, shipper sourcing is 63% of all freight is sourced through shippers, 23% through brokers, and 14% through load boards. What is astounding to that is with all the noise around digital apps is they only represented 20 basis points, 0.2% of all freight is sourced to digital apps, which we estimate to be about $850 million is coming through digital apps when you add, aggregate them. But the incumbents have something to say about this as well. You know, these companies have received massive valuations, and the only way that they can actually get a return, their investors can get a return, is they have substantial exits. But the incumbents have said, this is a B2B environment, we have the infrastructure, we have the customer relationships, we have the data, and they've started to respond. And so XPO rolled out its Connect platform. And JB Hunt has rolled out 360. In fact, what was interesting in the first quarter is that JB Hunt's 360 program on a run rate of about $400 million based on their earnings report, the first quarter. If that, if, if our studies are correct in our, in our information, that we believe that uh, the JB Hunt 360 program is the largest digital app after nine months. We think they're the largest digital broker platform out there. And so the incumbents, but then the question is, are they getting the valuation bump from that? And we, I think the analysts could, could answer that question. And of course, you'd be remiss if you didn't talk about Amazon and the fact that it's putting real pressure on the companies like UBS and FedEx. And one of the arguments that gets stated is that Amazon, while a significant customer globally, is a relatively small customer in terms of percentage of the, of the package companies. But 3% of UPS's global revenue comes from Amazon, while 10% in the United States comes from Amazon. So you think about the density factor that's taken away when you take away that significant or freight flow 10% of your volume is potentially at risk. And then there's Maersk, who, and it's, I saw this, so uh, our publishers, our editors, use this photo, and I thought, why did they use a rel to reflect the largest container company? I was like, do they, do we not know what Maersk does? And so I, I thought about it, I, re I reacted to it, I think I even sent an email, like, hey, by the way, Maersk is a, container, is a shipping company, not a railroad. Just want to keep that so you're aware of it. But what was interesting was Maersk chose to use this in the latest earnings report to describe their change from a maritime-based container company to a global, as they describe it, the aspirations to be the DHL of global shipping. That picture reflects containers that came out of China in the French countryside and never touched a boat. In fact, what Mer says is that those containers that came from China showed up as fast as one of their boats has, never touching a ship. And then we think about if the incumbents potentially will compete aggressively, if not at more scale, with the digital apps, how do the highly valued and highly capitalized digital-based companies, venture-based companies compete? Well, they have to change the model and the mode. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting, we, you, we think Convoy's a really interesting company because they're willing to break the mold. In fact, if you look at most of their team, they're not coming from the industry, they come from technology. But they're willing to try things different. And one of the things they just recently rolled out was this power-only universal trade pool. And think about that for a second. What really differentiates the asset-based guys with the non-asset-based guys? One of the big differentiations is trade pools. They're able to drop trailers at shippers. It gives shippers efficiency to load trailers. And perhaps more importantly, it allows drivers to maintain their hours so that they can keep running. And an ELD environment is pretty interesting. So Convoy says, we think we have a solution that can allow the smallest carriers to compete with the biggest. But one of the things about technology is it, it's a double-edged sword. It can tell us a lot about what's going on. So we've been buying a lot of ELD data, uh, acquiring it and looking at it and modeling it and trying to identify 
what's actually taking place in the market. And one of the things we realized is if you can get the ELD data, then you can actually tell where drivers are being detained. So we went through and modeled and laid out the entire country in these grids, these 200 foot grids, and looked at how long they're actually sitting, not, uh, not driving on duty, because that's really detention. And we wanted to understand where they're being detained. And so we wanted to publish this because we identified one shipper that had three of the four worst docks in America, by definition of detention, I'm serious. One shipper, and I, we, we know who it is, and so we wrote this article, and we're going to publish it, and our general counsel uh, said, don't write this. So we didn't. So we decided to focus on the cities. And to truckers, we talked about the fact that Washington, D.C. is where our services, hours of service go to die. Now, provocative headline, I think everybody that clicked on that thought, ah, they're saying something about the bureaucrats at the FMCSA, but we weren't. What we're actually saying is that if you look at the data, the number one city in America where drivers are being held up for detention is in the city of Washington. And what was also interesting is four of the top 10 cities in America where drivers are being held up is in Chicago. Now the other thing about ELD data, so we identified this, this shipper and we knew it. We, wrote, we were writing articles about futures markets and data and this very same shipper, with no prompting on our own, reached out and said, hey, I, I'm having problems finding trucks and my transportation costs are going through the roof. Well, we knew why, because you know, their average wait time is pretty significant. Three of the worst, fourth, uh, worst docks in America, of course. And they said, would you tell us where they're being detained? And we said, yes. And they said, we started asking some questions and they gave us a, a list of their facilities. We ran those and geocoded them and actually were able to not only tell them which facilities, we're actually triangulate it to the specific doctor in those facilities. And they have a mixing facility and they have a production facility and they thought that one of their facilities that was in uh, mixing was where the delays were and actually all of the significant delays were in these production facilities. And we were able to do that. So the thing about data is it doesn't lie. It does not have a bias in terms of the output. And all of this telematics information can actually create visibility for companies. And I think in the future, what you'll see are, are companies will start using this telematics information to understand where are drivers being held at, should there be time-based costing. Because let's be honest, the amount of miles a truck can put on is not the capacity constraint in the market. It's the amount of hours that it takes to go from point A to point B. And so whether we're talking traffic data, shipper delay data, weather, all of those things will be in future pricing components and I think we will start to think about pricing differently. Um, one of the things that we wrote a lot about was blockchain and I'm gonna touch on it, certainly the presentation of the next couple of days will really focus on blockchain a lot. But we started writing a lot about blockchain and uh, I got a call from a, a guy named Ken Craig and he's in the audience somewhere, uh, I don't know where. Uh, but uh, maybe, I can't tell these lights. Anyway, so Ken Craig said, hey, describe blockchain. We started writing about it. And I said, you know, we're thinking about starting this alliance thing, of bringing companies together to talk about standards. And he said, oh man, I love that. I want to join your alliance. And I'm like, cool, this is cool. And so by the end of that call, I checked my inbox and I had a, a press release format from McLeod and a note from Ken saying, hey, we want to join your alliance. And I said, oh God, we, so I called Ben Murphy up and I said, one of my colleagues, and I said, Ben, we got to create an alliance because Ken is going to do this press release next week. We got to go do this. So we created Bitta overnight. I started calling people frantically. Hey, you want to join our alliance? So we had seven companies. We thought when we did this release that we'd have 20 over the course of a year. And of course, you guys know the rest of the story. 2,060 within the first week. So massive disruptions. But I think what's interesting is that the technology that exists the framework that exists can actually create profound changes. And one of the recent discussions around all these food uh, issues and the idea that blockchain can actually create visibility. Now it may not prevent the foodborne illnesses, but what it could do is create visibility to where those foodborne illnesses started. So you think about Chipotle and its stock collapse last year when they had food problems, or two years ago, stock collapsed by about 30% within a week because consumers didn't want to go eat at Chipotle. 
because they didn't, totally couldn't get ahead of the news and identify which locations had the problem. And of course, it's hard to figure out, and we talk about freight, who does what? Is Amazon a shipper? Are they a broker? Are they a digital platform? Are they all the above? I think in the future, it'd be hard to figure out what companies are. And I think one of the most engineered companies, and you can say what you want about UPS, but it is by far the most meticulous and engineered company in our industry, and that's why it has such a reputable brand, because people trust it, but it's very, very structured. But they have had to think about their business model differently. And so recently, they, rumors had it, or news, was that UPS has partnered with Warner to do Last Mile. Warner's a truck locator doing Last Mile. So all these things are taking place right in front of our eyes. And of course, we can't forget the regulators or the lawyers, because they have to have a say. And so recently, in the state of California, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, probably a real favorite of you guys, sued, actually fined two freight brokers that had no presence in the state of California because they used carriers that were not adhering to California's rigorous emission standards. Now these two brokers did not have a physical location in the state of California, but still paid substantial fines for using carriers that CARB did not think was compliant. And so you think about that, it's pretty profound. They went out of state. So if you're a freight broker and you're somebody who perhaps has not been thinking about these elements of compliance and transparency, things like this, will, I think, will change that. So I want to thank you guys for being here. It's an exciting format. We're very excited to have you. And uh, uh, we're excited about what Demo Day is going to see. You're going to see some awesome companies. And I think transparency will, and visibility will be a core element of what they do. I want to welcome on the stage Lisa McGinty. Lisa and I talked about this two years ago. We both came from payments and we're like, this would be awesome. So Lisa will take you guys through the rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Sure.